recipient of the 2024 Kurt Lewin Award, Dr. Linda Tropp. Dr. Tropp is a professor of social psychology and a faculty associate in public policy at the University of Massachusetts Amherst. The selection committee has recognized Dr. Tropp as a leading authority on the use of psychological science to improve intergroup relations, and this award is a testament to her profound impact on the field. For more than two decades, Dr. Tropp has dedicated her research to exploring how members of different groups experience contact with one another and how disparities in group status impact these cross-group interactions. Her commitment to fostering positive intergroup relations while striving for greater societal equity and justice is evident in her extensive collaborations with a wide variety of organizations. In fact, eight of these organizations provided glowing letters of support for her award nomination, highlighting her work implementing evidence-based intergroup contact programs to build positive intergroup relations across various sectors. Dr. Tropp's remarkable career is exemplified by her contributions to intergroup contact theory, with more than 125 papers and multiple influential books, including co-authoring When Groups Meet, The Dynamics of Intergroup Contact. Dr. Group is excuse me, Dr. Tropp has received distinguished research and teaching awards from SPICI, the Society of Experimental Social Psychology, and the International Society of Political Psychology. Her synthesis of strong theoretical work and practical application to social issues embodies the legacy of Kurt Lewin. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Linda Tropp. My goodness, um, thank you so much for that incredibly kind introduction. I'm like already welling up and I haven't even started my comments. Um, it is my sincere pleasure to be here with all of you today. And before I offer some remarks, I believe a few more thank yous are in order. Uh, first, I would very much like to thank Gordon Hodson and Richard Crisp for writing a letter of nomination and to all members of the selection committee for selecting me for this award. Um, I would also like to thank all the organizational partners with whom we've worked closely over the last many years um, to try to make psychological research more accessible and more actionable and who graciously wrote letters in support of my nomination. I'd also like to thank members of my research lab at UMass Amherst, both past and present, um, all of whom have contributed greatly to our efforts to make academic research practically useful, spanning from our undergraduate research assistants to grad students and postdocs. Um, and I would also like to thank and truly acknowledge oh so many prior recipients of the Lewin Award, many of whom have served as formal and informal mentors over the course of my career, and some like Allport and Clark who I've never met but wish I had, and whose work has nonetheless served as a major foundation for my own scholarly development. I'm deeply honored and humbled to join in the ranks of such luminaries and acknowledging their immense contributions to the field of psychology offers what I think is a good springboard for some of the issues that I wish to touch upon today. So to begin, um, I would like to highlight that there have been so many recent calls for social relevance and impact that have grown and continue to grow in our discipline over the last many years. And I'd actually like to suggest that rather than being a new focus, we're actually witnessing a renewed focus or more of a renaissance of social relevance in making psychological research relevant uh, to policy and practice. To provide a bit of historical context, as many in this room know, Kurt Lewin stressed that it's not sufficient to do research simply for the sake of academic publication, uh, but that ideally academic research should lead to some, for some form of social action. But even before this very well-known and often cited statement by Lewin, even back in the 1930s, psychologists expressed a great deal of interest in forming a new professional society that would be dedicated to addressing social problems and testing hypotheses relevant to social change. And this eventually became known as our very own Society for the Psychological Study of Social Issues. Later, throughout the 1950s, psychologists such as Kenneth and Mamie Clark reported on problems faced by racial minority youth for a US White House-sponsored conference on children and their health. And these psychologists, along with many others, prepared and signed on to the classic and influential social science statement that summarized research evidence relevant to the landmark Brown versus Board of Education cases that 
led to the desegregation of public schools in the United States. Moreover, across many decades, numerous leaders in our discipline have stressed the importance of making academic research relevant to social issues. For example, past APA president George Miller said that he couldn't imagine anything that would be more relevant to human welfare and nothing that could pose a greater challenge to the next generation of psychologists than to discover how best to give psychology away. A generation later, and in his own Lewin Award address, Thomas Pettigrew stressed that our society and world are faced with an array of threatening problems that deserve intense scientific scrutiny, and that social psychology has distinctive and important contributions to make to the analysis of and remedies for many of these problems, and yet, our discipline has yet to apply the full force of its research and theory to social policy. And then more recently, APA President Jessica Henderson Daniel emphasized that almost every aspect of human existence is impacted by psychological science, and almost every social policy can be informed by it. So taking all of this history and all of these viewpoints, we might ask ourselves, well then why is it that as a discipline, psychology has not necessarily had the level of social or public impact that we would ideally like for it to have? I can think of at least a few reasons why this might be the case, and I believe Henderson Daniel provides a glimmer as to at least what one of these might be, because she goes on to say, that she firmly believes that psychologists and psychology students need to be in more rooms, at more tables, and at the heads of those tables when decisions affecting the public are formulated and implemented. And I think she's absolutely right. Based on what I've seen and experienced doing public-facing work, there are relatively few psychologists in that space. There are more often, you know, as I see political scientists and econ economists being asked for their perspectives, being at the table, and I think we need to have more psychologists at that table as well. But I think there's also more to it than that. In part, I think our limited collective impact has to do with what has traditionally been valued during our research and academic training. As Abigail Dalton and Max Bazerman describe it, academics are and are trained to be in love with their newest idea, whereas practitioners and policymakers want to know what works such that they're unlikely to care about how new the effect is and are instead much more interested in how it can be used. But as we know all too well, as academic psychologists, in order to publish our research findings, we have to show something new. We have to show something that's theoretically novel. And this may in turn respond or feed into a common critique that we often encounter, which is that by focusing on theoretical novelty, we might fail to deliver insights of interest or utility to members of the public. So then how did we end up here from those early beginnings? I think part of the challenge is that critiques about social relevance aren't the only critiques <laughs> that are leveled against psychology as a discipline. At the same time, we contend with critiques about our status and legitimacy as a science. And as described by Lilienfeld, whenever we psychologists dare to venture outside the hallowed halls of academia, we're likely to encounter at some point a puzzling and for us troubling phenomenon, which is that most of us will eventually or inevitably hear the assertion from laypersons that psychology, which those of us within the profession generally regard as the scientific study of human behavior, that psychology is in actuality not a science. Or as put more succinctly by Cook, psychology has occupied a precarious place in the hierarchy of the discipline such that uh, the scientific, I'm sorry, uh, has occupied a precarious place in the hierarchy of the sciences such that we appear to suffer from adolescent physics envy. So as psychologists, we end up in this type of what I see as a tug of war between seeking to try to prove how scientific we are and seeking to make our work useful to society. And I think this is where we also encounter some fundamental ambivalence about um, the practical value of our work, which is often referred to as applied research, relative to the scientific value of our work, which is often referred to as basic research. And I think Medin captures this dynamic quite well when he states that dichotomies such as those that distinguish between basic and applied research are actually dangerous territory for us and may get in the way of our doing our most valuable and important work. I wholeheartedly agree. And I think for a long time, the social relevance of the work we do has often been construed as being at odds with doing good science or conducting rigorous research. 
And it makes me wonder if, as a possible alternative to this ambivalence or this tug of war that so many of us encounter, we were able to claim and unapologetically reframe the nature of our work as being based in an explicit valuing of both ends of this spectrum and doing our best to balance and incorporate valuable elements from each. Now, granted, you might be thinking, I'm in a fortunate position to be able to offer this reframe. And I feel I am fortunate in the position that I hold. I was trained at the University of California, Santa Cruz. Go slugs. Um, it was co-advised by Steve Wright and Tom Pettigrew through what Tom Pettigrew describes as a contextual social psychological approach, which considers how psychological processes are shaped by societal and historical contexts and by social conditions at multiple levels of analysis. And scholars in this tradition tend to believe that this approach can help to bridge gaps between scientific research and its practical application because greater contextualization helps to establish links between our abstract theoretical principles and the concrete realities that people face. Now, in addition, some of you might be thinking to yourself that I'm in a fortunate position, thinking, well, you know, it's easy for you to offer that we should consider this type of approach. You're a tenured professor. On the one hand, I think that's fair. Um, but trust me, um, I vividly remember the feelings that I had as a graduate student. Steve is out there who can corroborate. <laughs> um, for I was truly convinced, and I say this with all veracity, truly convinced that I would never get an academic job because the kind of work that I did wasn't flashy enough or mainstream enough. Now keep in mind, my graduate years were the late 1990s when research um, involving implicit measures and social neuroscience were on the rise. And I, um, and I remember seeing the academic marketplace for what it was and thinking very deliberately and intentionally about trying to do enough of the types of work that was deemed valuable in the field so that I would have sufficient legitimacy or status in the discipline to really focus more on the types of work that I wanted to do. But even if we were able to be explicit about equally valuing scientific discovery and practical utility, I think it could also be useful for, for us to recognize that depending on the research questions we ask or the goals that we have for any given study, we might lean more toward one end of the scale or the other, and that's okay. Um, as individual researchers, we might also have our own proclivities or interests or aptitudes that might also lean us toward one end of the scale or the other, and I also think that's okay. Um, moreover, like researchers from many other fields, we might have varied views about whether or how our values do shape our research or should shape our research. We might also engage in healthy debates about the role or the roles that academic research might play or should or should not play in relation to the social issues that we study. But given all this variability, I think it's all the reason for us to be more explicit about valuing both scientific discovery and practical utility and encouraging researchers from across the basic to applied spectrum, wherever they may land, to highlight the strengths of their chosen approach while also being open about potential limitations associated with it when and where they exist. Now, in my own work, I really do think that I tend to occupy some middle ground in this basic to applied continuum. And I've come to describe the type of research that I do as conducting socially relevant research. In electing to use this term, you'll see that I'm veering away from using the term applied, in part because in the traditional basic applied dichotomy, basic, I believe, has been regarded as the real research where theoretical principles are tested. And the term applied has broadly been used to represent tests of existing theory in a non-experimental context. Uh, but to my mind, this dichotomy precludes the possibility that new theory or scientific discoveries may de be developed as well as tested when attention is granted to social conditions and contexts within which theoretical principles and psychological processes operate. Moreover, at least to me, a term like socially relevant research allows for more of a full cycle psychology approach through which our efforts to test theories in context can often lead to new discoveries that might inform further extensions of existing theory. And so in the remaining time that I have, um, I'd like to offer just a few examples of what I would regard to be a socially relevant research approach, including some examples from my own history of scholarship. 
And I should add, before I present any of these studies, you know, for those of you in the audience who might have concerns about focusing too much on application or practical value at the possible expense of science, I hope you'll see that valuable extensions of theory and new discoveries can grow from greater attention to context. And for those of you who are more interested in practice and application, uh, I hope you'll see what stands to be gained from conducting rigorous research with an eye towards social relevance so that we can develop a clearer and stronger evidence base and offer clearer theories of change with which we can then address social issues and engage in public-facing work. Now, in my view, one clear benefit of engaging in a socially relevant research approach is that it can motivate us to seek replication and test for consistency in our research findings. Because if we're hoping to have a practical value and we're hoping for our research to have public impact, we are going to want to make darn sure that we're confident in our results, right? This was actually part of the impetus for the meta-analysis of intergroup contact effects that uh, I conducted with Tom Pettigrew. And at the time, at least to me, and the more seasoned scientists in the room, I'd, I'd love to hear your impressions of this, but at least to me, the state of the literature at the time approximated what seemed like an extended ping pong match, where some research would say, contact works, and then other people would say, no, it doesn't, and it would kind of volley back and forth like that on and on for decades. So in our case, for our analysis, we, tr we tried to find every single study we could that was ever conducted in psychology or in other fields that focused on intergroup contact effects to see what the literature would tell us overall. Our final data set included more than 500 studies conducted between the 1940s and the year 2000, including responses from 250,000 participants in 38 countries. What we found is that overall, and in 94% of the cases, greater contact between groups was typically associated with lower levels of intergroup prejudice. Or to give you a more precise summary of what we found, um, if you look at this graph, you can see each of those blue dots is one of the more than 500 studies that we encountered. Looking at the horizontal axis, where it says contact prejudice correlation, the zero point in the middle of that horizontal axis means that there was a zero correlation, no meaningful association between contact and prejudice. And you can see that the bulk of the cases, a very high concentration of those blue dots is on the left-hand side, in the negative value side, basically suggesting an inverse or negative correlation such that greater contact is associated with less prejudice. We also um, estimated the mean effect size for all of those cases, which is represented by that red line in the middle of the distribution, corresponding to a correlation coefficient of about negative 0.21. So it's a relatively modest correlation, but one of the things that we noticed is that it was a very consistent uh, association and one that had a considerable amount of consistency across many different types of robustness checks and also in relation to many different types of contextual variables, which can give us more confidence in the overall trends we were observing. Now, importantly, I also want to mention that this study also helped us to um, identify some key moderators of contact effects that hadn't been explored before. And in the interest of time, I'm, I'm just going to describe one of these moderators, which shows that the positive effects of contact in reducing prejudice tend to be weaker among samples drawn from minority status groups or historically disadvantaged groups as compared to the effects of contact among members of majority status groups or historically advantaged groups. As a follow-up, I wanted to see if it could replicate. So I conducted a secondary analysis of a national data set of black and white Americans from 2000 where I saw the same basic effect, that the association between contact and attitudes was on average weaker for black Americans as compared to for white Americans. And furthermore, this uh, additional analysis showed that a likely reason for this was because of the pervasiveness of racial discrimination perceived by black respondents, such that those greater perceptions of discrimination as a negative form of contact, as we would now describe it, seem to inhibit the potentially positive effects of contact. So a key takeaway from this work for practitioners is that program facilitators and evaluators need to be mindful of how different status positions in the larger society might shape group members' experiences during their contact programs, as well as affecting potential outcomes of those programs. Now, admittedly, 
most of the studies that were included in that meta-analysis. You know, we published it in 2006, we completed the data set as of December 2000. Uh, so most of the studies included in the meta-analysis were conducted in the United States, and a large proportion of those US-based studies focused specifically on black-white relations. And this is clearly a limitation or a shortcoming associated with the existing contact literature as of that moment. At the same time, on the other hand, I should mention that contact interventions are very regularly used all around the world to try to ease intergroup tensions where there's been conflict or try to improve intergroup attitudes where there's been segregation. So if we really want to make broader claims about the applicability of contact or add caveats regarding its applicability, we also need to examine the effects of contact in a broader array of societal contexts than what has historically been done. So over the last many years, I've been involved in a number of collaborative projects to try to examine the effects that contact might have in societies with different varieties of social division. And in so doing, we sought to test some of the boundary conditions or potential boundary conditions for contact effects to see whether we might still see salutary or encouraging contact effects even under particularly challenging social conditions. Thanks for that added drama. <laughs> Now I know everyone's ready. All right, so as one example, we've conducted some research in Hungary to see whether contact effects might be observed in contexts where prejudice is highly normative. If you're not familiar with the Hungarian context, in Hungary, anti-Roma sentiment is quite blatant and widespread. Members of the Roma community are, are regularly common targets of hate crimes and hate speech. Um, so we collaborated with the Living Library program sponsored by the Council of Europe, where students have contact with kind of living narratives or living representatives of different marginalized communities who are volunteers, human volunteers, representing different marginalized groups, and which allow program participants to hear first-person accounts of their experiences. And in the case of the evaluation study that we did here, some of the students met with members of the Roma community and engaged with them and learned more about their lived experiences in Hungary. And some students met with members of other marginalized groups. And all of the students participating in this program completed surveys before and after their participation. Uh, overall, our findings showed that students who had contact and engaged with a Roma person during the program showed less social distance towards Roma, or in other words, greater willingness to engage with Roma people in general, as compared to those who did not interact with a Roma person during the program. But we also wanted to think more about this context of having pretty hostile local norms. So in the study, we also asked participating students about the attitudes towards Roma that they perceived among their peers and we found that students who reported having more prejudiced peers on the left, they themselves reported greater social distance from the Roma or less willingness to engage with the Roma compared to students with less prejudiced peers. But interestingly, we observed the same basic pattern of effects for the contact program across both groups of students. So even though their baselines might have differed, the process of engaging in contact appeared to have similar effects. Now we've also sought to test whether contact might play a role in rebuilding trust between groups in the aftermath of mass violence through collaborating with a number of peacebuilding organizations working in Rwanda. In this uh, study, survivors, perpetrators, and bystanders of the 1994 genocide were recruited from rural communities in eight districts across Rwanda, as noted by the blue dots in the map on the right. They participated in one of two contact-based programs over a period of several months. Here, as a note, I'll just add that they were not randomly assigned. I firmly feel, far be it from me, as a white American psychologist with no experience of genocide to randomly assign participants to the program that they need the most. Um, we can talk more about that later if you wish. Um, but after participating in one of these two contact-based programs, all of the participants in these programs completed surveys through interviews with co-ethnic testers given relatively low rates of uh, literacy before and after they participated in the programs. These two contact programs differed in their focus and content, such that those who took part in the facilitated dialogues met in ethnically mixed groups, the top photo depicting them, to talk about their feelings and attitudes in relation to the genocide, um, and also their hopes for the future of Rwanda 
and those who took part in the trauma healing program instead, the bottom photo depicting them meeting one-on-one -on -one with a peer and receiving some training in how to provide emotional support to each other as they worked through the trauma from the past they experienced. Overall, what we observed across both programs is that participants in these programs were more willing to trust other people in Rwanda generally after having participated in one of these programs, and then more specifically among survivors, they became more willing to trust former perpetrators and bystanders and more willing to live in integrated communities with them after having participated in these programs. So we're hoping that studies like these can help to support the idea that contact may be a useful strategy for building trust and improving intergroup attitudes, even under some particularly challenging circumstances. Uh, but I still think it's important to acknowledge that all the studies I've talked about so far have predominantly focused on shifting intergroup attitudes. And other work would suggest that we need to broaden the scope of contact research to consider, consider not only intergroup attitudes as an outcome of contact, but also to consider the policy implications of contact. For example, some important work by Dixon, Durham, and Trudeau has stressed that members of advantage groups might express positive attitudes towards the disadvantaged. They might like them or express encouraging feelings towards them, but may still not support policies intended to improve the disadvantaged group's position. And I was fortunate that these researchers invited me to collaborate with them on a national probability survey of white South Africans in a country with its own history of apartheid and extreme racial inequality to examine whether white South Africans' contact experiences with black South Africans might shape their support for policies that would benefit black South Africans. So we looked at policies that white South Africans had tended to oppose. These are actual findings from our, our survey. Um, as you can see in the slide, these uh, policies included returning lands stolen from black families during apartheid, affirmative action programs that would show preference for black job applicants over white job applicants, and more broad economic empowerment programs that would promote black advancement in South Africa. Overall, we found that white South Africans who reported more positive and close contact experiences with black South Africans showed significantly greater support for these equalizing policies, as well as reporting less prejudice towards black South Africans and lower feelings of racial threat. Moreover, we found that it wasn't just reducing prejudice towards black South Africans that contributed to white's policy support. Instead, that pathway between white's positive contact experiences and their policy support was associated with lower feelings of racial threat. So we're learning something new by paying close attention to the dynamics of the local context. As another example of broadening the scope of contact research, we partnered with some organizations working in Kosovo to examine whether following a period of ethnic conflict and continued ethnic segregation where relations between ethnic groups are still quite fragile, contact might help to build prospects for peace and reconciliation between ethnic groups on different sides of the conflict. Here we worked with organizations implementing outdoor education programs that included a mix of ethnic Albanian and Serb youth, where they participated in several outdoor activities, including some that explicitly required cooperative interdependence along the lines of what contact theory would suggest, such as where they had to jointly build mountain shelters or things like that as part of their mountaineering course. Um, and in this study, we were able to uh, gather survey responses from youth both before and after they participated in the program, as well as gathering pre and post surveys from comparable ethnic Albanian and Serb youth who did not participate from the program, but who were from the same municipalities or regions, similar ages, and so on. And what we found is that those youth who participated in the program grew more likely to believe that ethnic reconciliation was possible compared to non-participating youth, um, as well as feeling more willing to trust and having more positive attitudes, as has been found in prior research. So as I hope you can see from the few brief examples I have provided, I think we can learn a great deal about the social phenomena we study and extend relevant theory while also paying careful attention to context, and in so doing, helping to support practitioners and civil society organizations in making academic research useful and relevant to their goals. And as you might imagine, um, 
from being engaged in a lot of these types of projects where we've worked very closely with organizations designing and implementing programs, we've learned a great deal about some of the greatest challenges that uh, practitioners and organizations face, both when they're trying to execute their programs more generally and more specifically when they're trying to incorporate insights from the academic research literature into their work. So to come more for cir full circle and more fully support them in their work, members of our lab, uh, we've been working to create new resources for practitioners and civil society organizations who seek to implement contact-based programs so that they can begin to really concretely envision in actionable ways how they can incorporate insights from the intergroup contact research literature. So in closing, um, I simply wish to stress once again that even though enhancing the social relevance of our research is often construed as being at odds with the scientific enterprise, I don't think we need to accept the premise that pursuing socially relevant research and maintaining a scientific focus are inherently in opposition to each other. Instead, I think we can offer a new frame to suggest that both scientific pursuits and the practical utility of our work are to be valued, and that in many cases, focusing on the social relevance of the work can bolster our scientific efforts. Thank you. microphones for any questions you might have. Thank you very much. Uh, before I, I ask my question, I'd like to say that Pettiger and Trop 2006 is the paper I've cited the most in my entire life. And I think that's true for a lot of people. So yeah. yeah. <laughs> That said. Yeah. <laughs> yes, no, no, not that said. Um, it's, just, it's a great and very useful paper. Um, so first, I'd like to really thank you for your comments and to remind us of the struggle that I sure, I'm sure many of us face, um, that tension between making research, um, what we call you know, theoretically relevant and making it practically relevant at the same time. Um, and I, I love the way that you guided us through that process and, and you showed us the way that you did it. Um, do you have advice for younger people starting in the current atmosphere, which is more aggressive in many ways? And as you said, you know, we, we're forced to love our new idea, a, a thing that has only become worse over time. And so how do people who are now trying to rise to the academic ranks get to where you are, most people probably won't, most people can't, but to get to somewhere like where you are, how do we fight the forces that are making us publish essentially lots of irrelevant nonsense because we have to get the high impact journals? Oh gosh, what a question. Um, you know, I paired a whole bunch of extra slides trying to anticipate questions, did not anticipate that one. Um, okay, so on one side, I would wanna give you hope because my generation of folks are a lot of the editors, our governing council, a lot of younger folks actually, I would say, right? So I think increasingly younger generations of folks are more interested in social relevance. Places like PNAS and science, nature communications are all interested in practical social relevance and those are very high status journals. So part of it might be, you know, the, the old guard of psychology catching up a little bit, although I guess I'm now part of the old guard, right? Um, so, so that's one thing that I would say. The other thing that I would highlight, and this is something I do just about with every organization I work with, is have very frank conversations about what their goals are. We really start from there. And then let them know that my goals as a researcher might not be the same as their goals. So there might be a couple of additional questions we might want to include to be able to extend theory and not just show that the same thing that's been shown before has worked, right? So very much in that replication extension type of thing. So in each of those studies, whether I reported it or not, 
we had measures of prejudice, because you kind of have to have measures of prejudice, so that we could also control for prejudice while looking at other outcomes that might be relevant, right? Um, and I have to admit, in response to this question, I've probably spent the last five or 10 years of my career, I feel like I've been like on the ropes in a, in a boxing match, like responding to critiques leveled at contact research, of which there are many, there is no shortage. And basically saying, okay, let's test it, let's see, like what are those boundary conditions? Because I wanna know. I, you know, I think a lot of people would say, that contact can work in any context, or think that that's what I believe. I've been called the contact lady, um, you know, when I present at different places. And I try to let people know when there's active violent conflict, I don't think contact is a great strategy. Peaceful coexistence would be a great goal, right? So um, I, off, I, I, I kind of wear those two hats. I try to think about what practitioners and organizations most need and then within the constraints that they work under, think about, okay, so what novelty can we add to this that hasn't been demonstrated before? And sometimes that's from learning about the projects themselves, and sometimes it's, it's in a related vein, but not exactly spot on with it. Um, I also, uh, um, you know, and I'll, I'll draw this from one of my colleagues at UMass, uh, Buju Dasgupta, I'm looking at Luis right now, but um, she often talks about having a diversified portfolio, right? So I understand that in those cases where we can't have as, as um, careful experimental control, right, like in the Rwanda case, it's like, okay, that will not end up at JPSB, and that's okay if we have a diversified portfolio. So I usually try to encourage my students to have somewhat more <laughs> mainstream projects that can get published in more high status recognizable psychology journals and then others that help them to develop the skill set and the track record of the type of work that they really want to do and and you know try to have some diversification in that um, and I will I tell you this as someone who received the feedback when I was a, an assistant professor in my third year review like my pre tenure review I received in the same letter from the department that I should incorporate more social cognitive measures and physiology, psychophysiology into my work and do more field research. <laughs> so I guess that would be my response at the moment. Hello, uh, thank you for your talk. And I am relatively new to the contact theory literature, so I apologize if this uh, question no is all misunderstood, but um, I'd be curious to hear your thoughts um, on and thinking about contact theory in the context of socially relevant research. What consideration should be made in determining the entity that facilitates the, con the contact uh, with thought to historic and existing power systems? I missed part of your question, I apologize. So social development, was it, or? Oh, sorry, just thinking about contact theory in the context of conducting socially relevant research, like okay. how should we determine who facilitates the contact yeah. while thinking about um, oh, yeah. power? So, um, great question. Um, and, I, oh, you know what, I'll go the other way, into my extra slides, yeah. Um, okay, so here's some examples of these slides, so what, I had heard a lot from practitioners was um, things like, well, yeah, we get the principles of equal status and cooperation and institutional support, but what does that look like? And we're like, well, we're going to tell you what it's looked like so you don't have to read 100 articles, right? So, um, so this is exactly what this guide was made for. This one in particular was developed for US-based organizations and practitioners to be user-friendly, because we also, in addition to talking with like national civil society organizations, we've also talked with a lot of really local, like small town in the Ozarks, or in Mississippi, or a refugee service center in Texas. Like there's, there's all the, and we're like, you can, you can still do this, even though it seems all complicated and academic, we're trying to make it as accessible as possible. So when we say, what do you wanna do when you set the stage for contact? You wanna be intentional about it and think about how you're framing that space. Who are the facilitators, right? Have people represented up from both sides. How are you going to recruit people to participate? You have to think about where the place is going to be. If it's a segregated community, 
how do you choose where the place is going to be? Are you going to provide transportation? Because transportation systems differ. You know, I still remember this one refugee serving organization that was bringing, you know, a faith based community and recent arrivals together, you know, because everyone wants to do bridging now, right? I was like, so do you have any sort of like glossary or dictionary of terms in both languages so that they know how to communicate with each other? Like if they're painting murals together, can you say what paint and paintbrush are in both languages? Or maybe even better, have them teach each other how to speak those terms so that they can each see. And I'm thinking about some work that Steve Wright and I did during my master's thesis, right? If you're the one in the dominant group, you know, and you see, you know, kids who are bussed in, uh, like, where English is not their first language, it becomes very easy for those white kids to think, you know, oh, they're stupid, they don't know what I know. But if they have to learn the other language too, then they're like, oh, it's really hard to learn a language, right? So maybe a way to equalize the status would be have them teach each other bits of that language. Um, so those are just some examples. But you know, if you look up cultivating contact in my last name, you will find this. If not, email me. It's made free of charge for anyone. The other one I would say is um, this other guide. It's not pictured as well here. Uh, but this other guide, I like the photo of me and Leora, one of my current grad students. Um, so we developed this guide uh, for the International Organization for Migration because they were really interested in contact research. And basically, just about every program they host at some point or other has a contact dimension to it. And they work in a couple of different types of contexts, some involving civil conflicts and some involving recent arrivals through migration or refugee asylum seekers and such. Um, and so these photos were from when we kind of, you know, revealed the, the, the toolkit that we developed for them about how to design, implement, and evaluate contact programs. Um, the, the final version looks more like that on the right. It's also available free of charge on the IOM website. Um, and as part of what, what I found so validating was part of that kickoff event that we had in Vienna, we also did a workshop for people, all those people in the photo were representatives from like 20 different countries, like different country offices, field directors and such. And we basically walked them through the entire guide and walked them through basic research methods. Like, we know you get frustrated with academics. Let's explain why we want to do what we want to do. You know, and we just had that time to go back and forth and try to make it as accessible and straightforward as possible. And then we offer toward the end of that toolkit some sample items. So we basically say, like, if you're interested in social cohesion goals, these are a few concepts that you want to study. These are definitions of them. These are sample items. If you want to study like a migra migration context, you want to assess things like threat, belonging, like, you know, ownership, like those types of things, right? So it's modular. So depending on the context, they can pick and choose the types of items that are most relevant to them. And then we took about 20 of those different concepts with sample items and had them do almost like a sorting task of which topics they think for surveys that they would want to run for their programs are very important to include, somewhat important to include, or not at all important to include. So it was kind of a validation for us in developing this guide, right? And it was like, yeah, everyone from every country, more than 20 countries said like all those basic social cohesion goals, like trust, empathy, willingness to interact, like, you know, we know these things, right? They were like, yes, very relevant, very relevant, very relevant. And then it really depended on the context, you know? Um, some people dealing with migration issues wanted more of the migration stuff, less of the civil conflict stuff. Um, so my hope is that, you know, it's not that we're dumbing down the research, it's more an issue of trying to make it accessible. So maintaining that, that through line of integrity, like this is what we know, this is what we don't know, this is what we know, <laughs> but in a way that is not scary for other people to access. That was a really long answer to your question. Get a little passionate about this stuff. Other questions for Dr. Trop? The power walk. Hi. Um, so as a recent social psychology PhD grad, um, you know, I'm now 
early career postdoc level. Um, one thing that I'm running into is that I feel like um, I'm not well versed in how to actually design interventions. Like I have great experimental methods. I have great training in theory. I'm finding myself in a setting now where nobody really is interested in my conceptual models as much. They're kind of like, okay, great, you got that. How are you going to actually do something with it? Um, so I guess my question is about how we as social psychologists and psychologists can rethink actually training or what are the ways in which perhaps like implementation science could become a component um, for us to be able to really be prepared as emerging scientists to apply our work as quickly as possible um, to these social issues that we are very passionate about. Thank you, and I love that in making the transition uh, beyond PhD that you're already including a comment with the question. Very well done. <laughs> um, I, I wanted to basically say, um, you know, a lot of students, it's not necessarily part of the psychology curriculum, but a lot of students, at least those working in my lab, take courses on program evaluation, qualitative methods, other approaches, depending on, on what their interests might be. Um, I also, this coming spring, I'll be offering a, a new graduate course on public engagement and outreach, because I've done a lot of that. And that's another place where people are like, I don't know like how to, how to make messages accessible, right? Um, and so we've done, oh wait, I think I have extra slides. Nope, wrong way. There. Um, so yeah, at the public engagement project at, oops, wrong one. Uh, public engagement project at UMass. Um, I have served on the steering committee since its inception. I served as director or co-director in past years. Um, we basically are a faculty-led initiative to help train uh, and support faculty who want to do public-facing work. Um, and it includes things like, you know, from having conversations with organizations to talking with policymakers to like all the different steps involved in trying to make a difference through your research. Um, I also wanted to give a shout out to this new report from the Association for Public Land Grant Universities in the bottom right, Modernizing Scholarship for the Public Good. They um, include our, pet, our public engagement project as one of many models of how to modernize scholarship exactly toward the goals that you're interested in, but they give different models. Like this is what different public universities offer or have tried doing. And I also just wanted to mention on the left that one of the other challenges that you will encounter if you haven't already is, okay, so you do all this public facing work or all this intervention science or implementation, and then you don't know how to report it as something valuable when you're asked to provide a summary of all of your academic activities for the dean or the personnel committee, right? So I used to serve on the Faculty Senate Council for Public Engagement and Outreach at my university, and we developed this guidance document, which is publicly available, um, to help faculty learn how to report, you know, that it's not just service, that it is public-facing research, activity or public facing teaching activity if you're training people on scientific methods in applied settings. So yes, so I wanted to mention those. Um, and then I also wanted to mention at the risk of looking at, you know, like citing myself, um, but one of the chapters in this book that I edited a few years ago, the, the last chapter saying involving students in engaged research, that's it's like this whole thing, this whole book was intended to be like a how-to guide for people who are interested in having research make a difference but don't know where to get started. Um, and that last chapter, Jamie Franco is lead author on, and it really talks about like how to get undergraduates involved, but in so doing, it kind of walks you through the process of how to work with communities or how to face communities. I should also give a shout out, well, like probably to many people in this room, like Meg Bond, who talks about, um, doing work with community organizations, Jeff Morayama, who does building partnerships with schools. Like there's, you know, if you look at the table of contents, you'll be like, oh my gosh, all my favorite busy people. Not all of them, some of my favorite busy people. And little known fact, which should probably be better known, half of all proceeds of this book donated to SPISI automatically. Yeah. I'll also mention briefly um, <laughs> that there are also different models for making one's work matter. 
So there's the traditional scientific expert approach where we just proselytize and say what we know, and then there's like a community engaged model where we co-create knowledge with communities. I, I don't feel that either of those fit me very well, so we've just outlined kind of a third path um, in this paper where we talk about it like building relationships but still maintaining our autonomy as researchers. So you might also find that useful. Any other questions about the stuff, feel free to ask me. Hello, thank you. Is it working? Okay, yes. Uh, thank you so much for that presentation. That was really interesting to hear. Um, as I'm sure you're aware, there is a section of the collective action literature that talks about how um, intergroup contact is really helpful for like reducing prejudice, but that when it comes to marginalized communities, that contact can actually reduce the desire or the actual engagement with collective action um, because it obfuscates the systemic problem, right? It makes people feel more like, well, this person didn't treat me badly, so maybe there's not a systemic issue that's happening. Um, so I'm really curious about like what you, what your thoughts are about like the limitations about the more like systemic social movement kind of application of intergroup contact research, just based off of the work that you've done. Yeah, thank you for that question. That was one that I anticipated due to time constraints. So I will tell you that at least from a dominant group perspective, admittedly dominant group perspective, in addition to um, seeing that greater contact is associated with greater policy support, we've also done research in the United States showing that the more white Americans have meaningful contact and relations with black people in the United States, um, they were not only more willing to support the movement for black lives, but also attended more Black Lives Matter protests um, through processes of empathy and anger, such that the more contact they experience with black Americans, the more they empathize with what black people experience, the more they empathize with black people in the US, the more anger they feel about how black people are treated. And it's that anger kind of similar to the relative deprivation literature, it's that anger that feeds into taking action to promote social change. Beyond that, I did prepare some additional slides on this one, yes. So beyond that, we've worked as part of like multinational research teams to look across many different societies and contexts, what are the associations between contact and support for social change? And we do see a difference in the patterns of effect. So that thicker line, that thicker horizontal line basically represents a zero correlation or a zero effect size. And so you can see on the left where there are ethnic majorities, on the whole, you see encouraging effects of contact, more contact, more support for social change. Whereas on the right, that's for ethnic minorities where the findings are much more mixed, right? So in some cases, there's greater support for social change. In some cases, there's less support for social change when ethnic minorities have contact with the ethnic majority. That is a general trend that has emerged in the literature, and at the same time, I want to give a shout out to some notable research examples, including a lot of the work that I know Demis Glassford, Julia Becker, Steve Wright, and his colleagues have been involved in showing that intergroup contact does not necessarily have to undermine support for social change among minoritized groups, provided that there are some explicit indications that that inequality is not okay, such as when the contact includes an explicit acknowledgement of group differences in power and status. Um, I should also mention Melis Ulu and I, um, she's at the University of Sussex. We've, we've also done some work showing how when there's actual communication about the unequal treatment and in inequalities, that can actually help members of dominant racial groups to be more willing to recognize their privilege in ways that propel greater support for and interest in participation in collective action. Um, also, when dominant groups, you know, confirm that status inequalities are not legitimate, indicate support for efforts to promote intergroup equality. Um, I'd like to think of these things as certain, like, things that we can be more intentional, intentional about infusing within the contact situations themselves so that we can, instead of having to choose <laughs> towards saying, like, well, we're, we're just going to get along or we're just going to focus on structural change, that we can think about how can we live together and work 
together for social change, knowing that it's not going to be easy, knowing that it's not always going to be uncomfortable, but what are the actual processes involved in that? I would love to see future generations of research focus on that. I think we're just about at time, so I'm gonna ask you to join me again in thanking Dr. Linda Trout. <laughs>